Welcome to Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby. I am your host, Amber Sitton. What is done in darkness will eventually come to light. That is the purpose of this podcast, to shine light on the disappearance of Jessica Hamby. Listener discretion is advised. The subject matter may involve violence, sexual content, murder, and adult themes. It is not suitable for younger listeners. This is episode one of season three of a serialized podcast, and the episodes are designed to be listened to in order. Jessica Leanne Hamby has been missing since January 3rd, 2018. At the time of her disappearance, the 24-year-old mother of three was a beautiful brunette with big hazel eyes. She had a head full of long, thick hair, was about five foot two, and weighed about 125 pounds. In the four and a half years since Jessica was last reported to be seen, the stories regarding her disappearance and fate have been plentiful and the facts scarce. In season three of Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby, we are starting from the beginning. And by the beginning, we are beginning with Jessica's life six months prior to her disappearance. We are going to focus on the details and try to discern fact from fiction. In this episode, as always, you'll hear from private investigator Michael Fleming. You will also hear from a special guest, private investigator Jeff Means with Sound Mind Investigations. He has been working on Jessica's case from almost the beginning. He has devoted thousands of man hours and uncountable resources to this case. Jeff's hard work has given us a huge head start in this case. You'll hear many details about the last 12 hours of her life in this episode. But first, we need to look at who Jessica was and what led her to this point in her life. Jessica described herself as free-spirited, a stoner, and a hippie love child with a gypsy soul. And that's how at least one family member described her as well. Here is Jessica's sister, Shana. She was very open, very free-spirited. I know that she eventually grew, like as she got older, she was pretty sad on the whole, the earth and like take care of the earth. Those that knew Jessica described her as feisty and spunky, but they also said she was giving and caring. Most of all, they described Jessica as a really good mother. I know that she, from a very young age, she knew that she wanted kids, and she got that a lot sooner than she probably anticipated, but she was always a really good mom. Even in the bad, she was always a good mom. Jessica had her first child at the very young age of 14. Like, she had help from my parents, and then whenever she was of age to start working, and she started doing that. Like, I didn't want any kids. I said, this is enough for me. You've had one that'll be my kid, too. But she was, like, really active. And, like, she didn't care that she was so young. She went headfirst into it, and she was awesome at it. Some of our interviews with family incorporate video. And this is the interview format we used with our first interview with Jessica's dad, Keith. We asked him to describe Jessica to us. He quickly pulled out a photo book that his wife had made and given him for Christmas. It was full of photos of Keith with Jessica and her children. My wife got me this for Christmas. She had this made for me, and it's a booklet of me and Jessica and Jessica and the kids, and there's a lot of good pictures in here, and there's one in particular, one in particular. So there's some really good pictures. The one that gets me and the one that probably I'll always say, this is Jessica. This is who she was right there. He held a photo of Jessica up to the camera for us to see. Jessica was sitting in the back seat of a vehicle with one of her young sons on one side and her daughter on the other. 
Jessica had her arms around both children as she snuggled them up tight against her. Her left arm is curved around her daughter's head, and Jessica has her eyes closed, and her cheek is resting on her baby girl's head. You can feel her love for those babies when you look at this picture. And knowing that Jessica is missing, my heart hurts knowing what those kids have lost. Keith continued to describe Jessica during the good times, before things took a tragic turn. Well, she could be a little rambunctious at times, but all in all, she was a really good kid. She was smart, definitely funny. I guess you could say she was kind of an old soul, because I remember when she was six or seven years old, her little sister was born, and all Jessica wanted to do was be Mama Hen. She wanted to change her diaper. She wanted to to feed her. She wanted to bathe her. She wanted to do all the things that a mother would do for a child. And I said, someday she is going to make a really good mother. And she she was a good mother until uh, the last year or two when everything spiraled out of control a little bit. But yeah, she was a, she was a good kid. She was she was good in school. Uh, she was a social butterfly for sure. A lot of friends. Everybody really liked her. She could get along with anybody as long as you know they treated her with respect. She would do the same for them. But she was a social butterfly. According to Jessica's family, around 2016, something changed with Jessica. No, I think it was like 2016, early 2016. I started noticing some stuff, maybe middle of 2016, somewhere in there. Things just weren't right. I mean, I I know people on drugs. I've been around them. I, I know addicts. I know how they were, and it. That's what it looked like to me. And I, I mean, you know, because the bills wasn't getting paid at her house the way they should. My comment to her was, well, if, you know, if you find you a good man, a real man, instead of this piece of trash you're with, I said, you can get this right, you know, and and get your bills paid. Make sure you go to work. He goes to work because Jesse was always a good worker. I mean, she worked hard. She would go to work and work 12-hour shifts and then pick her kids up and keep her kids And before all this stuff happened. So, you know, he, he got to the point where he wasn't paying any bills. He wouldn't work. He wouldn't do anything. And, of course, with her being addicted to drugs and being on those type drugs, she got to where she didn't want to go to work. You know, she just wanted to get high. You know, I've done what I could to help. I I think I probably paid the rent for five or six months, made her car payment for five or six months, seven months, whatever. But there comes a point, you know, and it, it's terrible and it, it stinks. You can't continue for your own sanity. You can't continue to give money and pay their bills. I mean, it just enables. I would give her cash. I would give, you know, I would give her money pay her bills and all that stuff. But when I would pay her rent or something, I would say, who does this check need to be made out to? Or who do I need to take it to? And I would try to, you know, pay the car payment on my credit card bill or my debit card with my debit card or something, just anything but cash. It got to the point where I wouldn't give her no cash because I knew he was going to get it. And I know I knew they were going to blow it on that crap. I mean, it just, It broke my heart, you know, to see somebody so beautiful, somebody with uh, just just a free spirit and just a kind person like she was, to go from being all that, being a great mother, being a hard worker, you know, having your own place, raising your kids, to just being addicted to that nasty crap that's out there. I mean, it literally just... It didn't nearly kill me just to watch it. For me, it was kind of sudden because now she may have been doing some stuff before I knew about it. It just came up on me really fast. Things just started going haywire. 
Her texts got to where they wouldn't make no sense. When she would call me, she would slur words. When I would go to her house or when she would come to my house, you know, you could tell. And I would say, what's going on? I said, what are you doing? And, you know, typical argument, nothing, Dad, you know. And then a couple of wrecks happened. She flipped a truck coming down Spruce Pine Mountain. She passed out. Then there was another wreck the summer before this happened up the road in Phil Campbell at the Y where her and three other people went around the curve and lost control and hit a pole and a semi. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured. I don't know how they weren't, but I guess God had his hand on them at that time. And then it just, you know, she started, she started doing typical things that an addict would do. She would want somebody to watch her kids. She wouldn't come back when she said she'd be back. Stuff like that. And I mean, it, it got worse and worse as time went over that next year. And finally, something happened in Haleville that caused her to want to get clean. It involved a very close friend of hers that was found hanging from a tree in Haleville. And she said, what can I do? Will you help me? Which she knew I would. We all would. Um, so she went She went away for a few months. And when she came back, she had gained weight back. Complexion was clear. I mean, she was, just, she was a beautiful girl. From that point on, it was kind of like a roller coaster ride. She would be good for a little while. Then she would, you know, backslide, I guess you would say. And I, I fought. I helped as much as I could until it got to the point where I'm like, I'm not giving you any more money. And I remember once she was in Colbert County Jail the summer before 2018. She had called me from the jail and she said, you know, my court day is tomorrow. Are you going to be here? And I said, yeah. I said, I'm going to come. I'm going to be there. I said, hopefully we can get you out and, you know, try to get you straightened out. And uh, I went up there, and I remember we got her out on the way back. I mean, and I've told her this many times. I'm like, Jesse, you got so much to live for. I said, you got these three beautiful babies. You got people that love you. And I know you can be successful at whatever you do. You have that drive if you have a clear mind. I said, but if you stay on this path, there's three options. Get clean go to prison, or die. And I said, there is no other options. That's it. And I would like to say that to anybody that's doing drugs or anybody out there, you know, it's in my shoes. I mean, that's that's the truth. Those three options are it. There are no other options. And one of those three is going to happen. As Jessica spiraled, her dad took her children in. Jessica was no longer able to provide them a stable home. Um, I actually took the kids in before this happened. You know, we just felt like it would probably be better if the kids come stay with, with me and my wife and our family until we could get help for Jessie and get her clean. Unfortunately, it did not work out that way. They are still with me and will be their blessing. I love them. It's uh, they got dealt a bad hand. They did, but we love them. We support them and they're thriving right now. They're great. They miss their mama. And we talk about it. We talk about it a lot. I want to add a quick side note here. Those of you that have been listening to this podcast for a while know how I feel about children. That's probably the most you're going to hear about Jessica's children from me. I think it's important that everyone realizes that this missing mother has three children whose lives have been forever impacted by their mother's disappearance, but they are children, and it's our goal to keep them, their names, and their faces out of the spotlight as much as possible. 
We asked Jessica's sister, Shana, what she thought triggered such a change in Jessica. I think it was a mixture. I think my sister had a lot of trauma that I didn't know about and still don't know about. But I also think the environment that she was in, I always held her accountable for that. I always told her, like, you're putting yourself in these positions with people that are going to do bad things. But I think a mixture of the trauma I don't know about and then her being in the right environment, it was just a deadly mix. It was toxic. It was, I mean, she had some mental health issues. It was just all the perfect combination for disaster. And that's what's happened. We know she experienced a series of traumas beginning in her teen years, none of which were her fault. She was a kid, and she was dealing with issues that would be enough to break any adult. Looking from the outside in, I think she tried to work through the mental and emotional damage inflicted on her, but it's clear she struggled. She also hid much of it quite well, and many of those closest to her didn't have any idea of the weight she was carrying around until she disappeared, and her life faced the intense scrutiny of a missing persons investigation. By then, it seemed it was too late. Shana told us that by 2017, she wasn't having much contact with her sister anymore. I kind of cut my contact with her a lot because I knew that she was into some really heavy stuff. I didn't want her to come to my house. I didn't want her around my daughter. I didn't want people being with her and them coming to my house. And I just, so I kind of had cut that part of her out of my life. She could call me. I told her she can call me if you need to talk. Or if you want me to take you somewhere like to a rehab or the hospital. But other than that, I can't give you anything and you can't come to my house. I know that she she had stayed at a like a hotel up the road from my house in Russell. And I don't know who she was with. I don't know what she was doing. But she had called my dad and she wanted money and he wouldn't give her any money. She was like, well, I'm hungry. And he was like, if you're hungry, I'll call your sister and see if she'll just bring you something up there. I'm not giving you any money. She had never done that before. I know that she had got involved with some people from Haleville that really sketchy, and she had kind of dipped out for a little while, um, for a couple months, to stay away from here. Um, I didn't hear from her during that time. Um, she had found out that she had got sick from sharing needles. It was just a lot of bad stuff that in that one year that just all packed together. Um, I know she had a friend get murdered or whatever they want to call it. And it was just a lot. And I don't think that helped that downward spiral. Then she went to detox at the end of 2017. So how long had it been since you had been in contact with her when she went missing? I want to say I had seen her two weeks before at my mom's. We had went, I took my daughter over there because she was, three or four and JC had been at my at my mom's and mom called and said will you please bring to my house and I said why she said because your sister's here and I said I don't want to come over there you know she's doing whatever she said she's not she's okay she's trying to detox so whatever and I said okay I'll bring her by there so I did go by there to my mom's was there I remember that because the Two little ones were coloring, and we sat there, and we talked. We had a good day. Um, Stayed there for a couple hours, and then I went home. And then I didn't talk to her until – I can't remember for sure if it was her. She might have called me and said, hey, I need Dad to put minutes on my phone. But – and I feel like she might have, or she – she said she tried to call. I'm not really for sure, but I knew that there was minutes needed for her phone. And I think that was right, like right whenever she disappeared. And that was the last time I've seen her was at my mom's house. As we interviewed Shana, it was obvious to both me and Michael that Jessica's disappearance had been extremely hard on her sister. Shana was able to discuss Jessica with us without becoming too emotional. Everyone handles grief differently. And this was clearly Shana's way of dealing with it. But Michael had two last questions for Shana. I've got two final questions. And we'll start with the easier one first. 
obviously there's there's a lot of thought that there are other people responsible for what happened. If you had the opportunity to say something to them right now, what would you say? And they can be unfiltered as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. I'm not a religious person, so I don't really lean towards all that. But whatever happens to bad people, hope you enjoy that. So, and I hope they have the day they deserve. <laughs> and the reason I said this was hard was because it, it can usually be emotional. If you could say something to Jesse right now, what would you say? I'm not a crier. <laughs> um, just that everybody's okay and that her kids are okay. Like, those kids don't need for anything. And um, that people are doing their best to figure out what happened. And find her, at least. Even if we don't ever figure out what happened, just at least find her. She deserves that. And that, um, that uh, as much as she might think it, that I hated her, it wasn't hate, that was tough love. So, that's probably about it. Because I'm not a very emotional person, but I don't know what just happened. <laughs> As Jessica's family has mentioned, she entered a detox facility right after Christmas in 2017. We believe the date that she was admitted was December 28th. The detox was named Journey, and it was located inside Lakeland Community Hospital in Haleyville, Alabama. Here is Jeff Means. Jessica, when she arrived at Lakeland, she was waiting, it's a detox, and she was waiting for a bed to go to a rehab and she had been doing this continuous cycle. We spoke to the woman that drove Jessica to the detox. She also spoke to Jessica on the phone numerous times while she was at Journey. She told us Jessica was trying to come up with the money for rehab once a bed became available and that her dad, Keith, told her he'd pay for the rehab. You will hear more about the other things she had to tell us in a later episode. On the night of January 2nd, 2018, Jessica and another woman named Brooke checked out of Journey Detox Facility. It has been widely reported that the two women left the facility that night because they had an altercation with another patient. Jessica's mom, Lynn, told us she had no idea that Jessica left the detox that night. Here's Lynn. That's the only time that she had left any rehab or detox center and did not call me. She did not call me that night, did not text me. Michael asked Lynn how she found out about Jessica leaving Journey. Well, I had been calling up there and checking on her, you know, talking to the nurses. Well, um, the second, that evening, I didn't call. So... The next morning on the 3rd, when I called, that is when I found out that she had left the detox center because she had gotten into an altercation, her and Brooke Graham with another girl, and that she was asked to leave the facility. Jessica and Brooke were waiting outside the detox for a ride. Brooke's boyfriend, Jonathan, was on his way to pick them up. Here's Jeff. Jessica has no clothes real nice clothes and everything like that. So Brooke lets her wear her clothes, dark pair of leggings, a pair of wool type boots that have buttons on the side. They go up to like her knees, cardigan sweater, lets her put some makeup on, look all pretty and everything. And Jonathan comes and picks them up. To put things in perspective, the night Jessica left Journey, Temperatures were in the low to mid-20s in the area. Jessica was out of minutes on her phone, and while they waited on their ride, she called her dad to ask him to put minutes onto her prepaid cell phone. When Jessica spoke to her dad, she didn't tell him that she was leaving detox, and he put the minutes on her phone for her. Jessica's phone turned on at 9 p.m., and she logged into Facebook 
and replied to a message sent just seven minutes earlier. The message was from Jessica's drug dealer, a man that she often referred to as her plug. He went by the screen name John Deere, but his real name is Travis. Travis lived in the city of Red Bay, Alabama, in Franklin County, which is approximately 40 miles from Jessica's location at the detox. Fifty seconds later, she tried to call him via Facebook Messenger, but Travis did not answer. One minute after Jessica messaged and called Travis, she sent a message to a childhood friend named Alicia Motes. The Facebook records obtained by law enforcement show that a minute later, Alicia accepted Jessica's messenger request, indicating that the two were not previously connected on Messenger and most likely not connected on Facebook either. But that part of the Facebook data is not included in the information we have in our possession. At 9.07 p.m., Jessica called Alicia via Messenger and they had a 73-second conversation. At 9.08 p.m., Jessica tried to call Alicia a second time, but Alicia didn't answer. At 9.09 p.m., Jessica sent Alicia a message that read, I tried. It's a weird number. It's my girl's number. We believe that Jessica was using Brooke's phone to try to call a phone number that Alicia provided her during their earlier Facebook Messenger conversation. 24 minutes later, a Messenger request was sent to Jessica from Alicia Moat's boyfriend, Eric Edwards. Alicia's cell phone was said to have a dead battery, and she was using a phone belonging to Eric. It has always been said that Alicia and her brother, Derek Motes, were staying with Eric at his home north of Hamilton, Alabama. Evidence shows that Brooke's boyfriend had just picked up Brooke and Jessica from the detox facility when Jessica and Alicia began to message each other through Eric's Facebook Messenger account. At 9.35 p.m., Alicia, via Eric's account, sent Jessica a map of her location. As Jessica, Brooke, and Jonathan left the detox, Alicia and Jessica exchanged numerous messages back and forth through Eric's Messenger account. Within two minutes of adding Eric to her Messenger account at 9.35 p.m., Jessica sent Alicia a message that said, Look, these people fighting bad that is driving me. I have nowhere to go. It's cold. Alicia replied and asked her who she was with. Jessica told Alicia that she was with a girl from Detox that gave her a ride. She said Brooke's boyfriend, Jonathan, was threatening Brooke. She described him swerving and almost wrecking them. Jessica said that he was threatening to put Brooke in the trunk for the rest of the ride and said that she was scared. Jessica told Alicia that she needed somewhere to stay for the night and mentioned again that she had nowhere to go. Alicia replied, yeah, come on. From the beginning of Jessica's disappearance, it has generally been believed that Jessica didn't leave the rehab with intention of going to see Alicia. Law enforcement was able to obtain Jessica's location data beginning at the time they left the rehab. The route they drove was not the most direct route to get to Alicia's location, and when viewing the location data, alongside the messages between Jessica and Alicia, it would support that they did change course near the time that Jessica asked her if she could stay with her that night. However, as we poured over this data, we noticed an important detail. The very first message that Alicia sent to Jessica through Eric's Facebook Messenger account was a map to her location. The link to the map was sent several minutes before Jessica began to express fear over her ride. At 10.05 p.m., Jessica, Brooke, and Jonathan arrived at the location Alicia had provided, which was a group of trailers and campers parked off of U.S. Highway 43 in an unincorporated part of Marion County, Alabama. While the mailing addresses in this area are Hamilton, the campers were located in an area almost halfway between the cities of Hamilton and Hackleburg. In January 2018, a major construction project was underway to replace the North Fork Bridge, 
and several of W.S. Newell's construction workers were living at that location off U.S. Highway 43 in those campers at the south end of that project. In 2018, the existing road and bridge spanning the valley north of Hamilton did not yet exist. To date, the original road and bridge that Jessica and her companions traveled on is what Google Earth still shows. At 10.05 p.m., when Jessica arrived at the campers, she sent Alicia a message on Eric's account, letting her know that she was there. One minute later, Jessica called Alicia via Eric's messenger account, and they spoke for 34 seconds. Jessica was met by Alicia, Eric, Derek, and others, including one of the construction workers named Gilbert. The group was hanging out at Gilbert's camper. Here is Jeff. From what I understand, Jessica's never met these people, the Edwards. Never met Eric Edwards, doesn't know Gilbert Shaw. It's just Alicia. And Derek was there, and Derek had a crush on Jessica of some sort because there's some kind of language in there that says, well, Derek will be excited or glad to see you, that kind of thing. This is the point in the story where things begin to get a little less clear and rumors have run rampant. Some of these rumors originate from some of the individuals present that night. Here's the thing about this whole case. All these people are on meth. You can't understand them half the time as far as where they're going. And it's really hard to discern the truth from fiction as far as when you're talking. I mean, there's people that are they sound like they're, you know, real smooth talkers and they're they're right on point when they're speaking to you, but their brain is so out there that they're just really good talkers. Because these rumors are widely known to anyone who's followed Jessica's case, we are going to share some of the stories that have been told regarding events at Gilbert's camper that night. It is rumored that Jessica offered Brooke and Jonathan drugs for the trouble of driving her so far out of their way, but that there were no drugs at the location when they arrived, and Brooke and Jessica got into an argument. Other rumors say that the only drug they had available was not what Brooke used, and that made her mad, or that Jessica and Brooke went to the bathroom to do whatever drugs they had. Yet another story is that Brooke and Jessica argued over some jewelry that Brooke dropped in the truck and could not find because Jessica had stolen it. What we do know as fact is that Jonathan and Brooke did not stay at that location. Cell phone records show the couple got back on the road and drove home within minutes of dropping Jessica off. Here's Jeff. I'll just say this. We know that Jessica was texting on her phone to this Brooke Graham chick from 11 p.m. January 2 to 6 a.m. January 3, she was texting back and forth 178 times. Now, why were they texting? What were they texting about? The events up to this point have been well reported over the years. From here, the traditional story has been that another man from the gathering at Gilbert's camper, Shane Reynolds, drove Eric, Derek, Alicia, and Jessica to Eric's house, which is a little over a mile down Elgin Cochran Road. Shane lived near the end of Elgin Cochran Road. The house that Eric and the group went to belongs to Eric's uncle, Raymond Edwards, and is co-located with Raymond's business, Edward Truss. Along with Eric and Raymond, Raymond's wife, Louise, and two female cousins of Eric's lived at the house. The geofence that we do have shows her phone at Shaw's, but it never shows her going to Raymond's. And by their own statements, she did go down there because Shane Reynolds picked them up and Eric, Derek, and Alicia, Jesse, they all went down to Raymond's. They went to the camper first, then to the house. That was their own statements. Jessica's phone records do indicate that she left Gilbert's just before 10.30 p.m., but that is just the beginning 
of what would prove to be a long night of near constant messaging and traveling along the dark and sparsely populated areas of North Hamilton. The movement I know she made, she wasn't walking. She was in a vehicle. Even the path that they took from the area of Elgin Cochran Road to get down to Hamilton, they didn't go straight down 43. She went all the way to the end of the road, and you know who lived down there. I have for the longest time been trying to nail down who was driving her around that night, because I know she was driving around all night. There's no question in my mind. I know that there's possibilities and the story has never been that, and I don't rule anything out. I keep my mind open, but I know for a fact that that Nilo's report, what it shows. Where did Jessica go that night? Who did she talk to? And what was she doing? Join us next time as we continue to investigate and find answers to those questions as we push for justice for Jessica. If you have any information that could help to solve the disappearance of Jessica Hamby, please email me at secretstruecrime at gmail.com or call our confidential tip line at 205-282-0740. Michael and I will ensure that all information gets to the right place right away. If you are left still wanting even more content, please check us out on Patreon. We have it filled with great information about Susan and Evan, Eric and Gypsy, and we will be adding additional content about Jessica. This podcast is an independent podcast. That means that everything that goes into making this podcast is done and funded by me. All the investigative tools and resources are provided by Echo 7 Foxtrot, and in this case, also Jeff Means with Sound Mind Investigations. The tragedies we highlight and investigate have had a tremendous impact on the victims, loved ones, and friends. We don't burden them with additional expenses to cover their cases. We donate our time and talents because we want to help and hope to find the answers they need that are so long overdue. For as little as $5 per month, you can receive exclusive access to members-only photos, videos, early access to episodes, and much, much more. By becoming a patron, you too are helping us help these families. Patreon.com slash Secrets Crime. I'll also post a link on our Facebook page. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to follow or subscribe in your podcast player of choice and by giving us a five-star rating and review in Apple Podcast. We are active on social media and will often share photos of Jessica. Follow Secrets True Crime on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secrets Crime. This episode was co-written by me and Michael Fleming. The audio production for this podcast is by Kane Power at precisionpodcasting.com. From the late 1960s to the early 1990s, the United States saw an unprecedented surge in serial killing, rooted not just in the dynamic changes of the post-war period, but in the development of the human psyche going back many millennia to our ancient past. Wonder why serial killers exist, why they emerge, and why they exploded in the post-war United States? Check out the golden age of murder, a panoramic look at serial killing, focusing on the United States in the post-war period with your hosts, Toby and Simeon.